Hi everyone, good morning. Welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna number 138. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn. I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. The Highland Archive Service has four archive centres across the Highlands of Scotland, one in Inverness, one in Wick, one in Portree and one in Fort William. This series is brought to you by High Life Highland, which is our umbrella uh, organisation that the Highland Archive Service sits under at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland's a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we are very grateful for that. This week I'm looking at uh, a deposited collection, so a collection that has been given to us by a family, an individual, a business, um, for, for long-term safekeeping. And this week it's D63, MacLeod of Cadball, which is a collection held in Inverness. The reason I've picked this collection to look at is because it's a collection I've had very little to do with, really, very little uh, interaction with. And it's been really fascinating over the years of Learn with Lorna, and I was astonished to work out a couple of days ago that in April I'll be going into the fourth year of Learn with Lorna, which seems uh, extraordinary. Um, some of the subjects that I've covered I've known a lot about before I went in. Some have given me the chance to delve into collections held in Labber and Sky in, uh, in Nucleus that I didn't know as much about. And some I've done from a complete standing start with no knowledge at all beforehand, things like the diatomite uh, collection. And some like this one, I'm kind of satisfying my own curiosity about a collection that I have gone past for years but never had cause to be in. And I think that's sometimes something that people don't really realise about our, our job as, uh, in archives, is that people assume that we're historians and, and we're not. You know, our role is to care for the collections and give public access to them not really to research into them. So it's quite um, lovely in my role to have an opportunity to, to do that. So what is D63 and who are the MacLeods of Cadball? Well, this collection really focuses on relatively recent generations, but I want to start with some background information about the family. The MacLeods of Cadball are descended from the MacLeods of Assent through Hugh MacLeod of Cambuscurry son of Donald, uh, Donald Van Moore. I've had a source that says the 9th and a source that says the 10th, so uh, of Assent, and Christi uh, Christian Ross of Pip Calney, his wife, and then his son, Aeneas MacLeod, who was the first of Cadball and Cambus Carey. In 1680, Aeneas MacLeod purchased the estate of Cadball from the Earl of Cromarty, hence the family becoming MacLeod of Cadball. The, the area we're talking about um, is in Ross and Cromarty, so it's in and around the Invergordon area, but I'll come on to that uh, as, I, as I go on. Now this Aeneas, the first of Cadball, would represent the, the uh, county of Cromarty, which later became part of the county of Ross and Cromarty, in the Scottish Parliament, and he was one of those who signed the Treaty of Union with England in 1707. So that's the kind of level of society we're, we're talking about, someone who is uh, at that time involved in that um, in those kind of politics. He was followed by his son Roderick II of Cadball, who is described like this in Mackenzie's The History of the MacLeods. Aeneas MacLeod was succeeded by his eldest son Robert, uh, Roderick MacLeod, II of Cadball. He took part in the Rising of 1745, but the estate was preserved to the family through the influence of the Earl of Sutherland on the condition that Cadball should live for a time abroad. So of course there would be an expectation that having taken part in the Jacobite side, the estate could be forfeited. But this didn't happen on the condition that he went away for a while. Possessing a literary taste, he accumulated a very extensive library while away. And on being allowed to return home, he brought it to Cadball, where he built four rooms entirely constructed of stone to hold this library. He registered arms in the Lion office about 1730. He married in 1751 his cousin Lilius, daughter of William Mackenzie III of Belmaduffy. They went on to have children Robert Bruce Aeneas, his heir and successor, and Margaret. He died in 1770 when he was succeeded by his only son, Robert Bruce Aeneas MacLeod, III of Cadball. 
He was then only six years old when his father died. And I'm aware, as I say, I'm going back in generations here, but it's important to see how the land and estates came into the family, I think. So we're on Robert Bruce Aeneas MacLeod, who is only six when his father dies and he becomes the third of Cadwall. About 1780, his trustees, so he was still a minor, bought Invergordon Castle, formerly called Inverbrecky, and uh, built by Sir William Gordon. The library collected by Roderick was removed from Cadbol to Invergordon Castle, but the latter was burnt down in 1805 and the whole of the books were destroyed, along with a large and valuable collection of Indian curiosities and silver plate, which Roderick had inherited from a relative who had been a captain of an East India merchant ship. This boy, when he grew up, it says contested Sutherlandshire, so again went into politics, and from 1807 to 1812 represented the county of Cromarty in Parliament. From 1794 to 1833 he was the first Lord Lieutenant of that county and he went on again to have several children being succeeded in 1844 by his only son Roderick MacLeod, fourth of Cadball. So that takes us um, into the kind of the mid 19th century and the family has bought the buildings and the estates that are perhaps now most associated with them, Invergordon and Invergordon Castle. It kind of breaks your heart to, to read that passing sentence about, you know, him, the father building that um, kind of intricately, deliberately built stone room to protect the books and then they're getting moved to the other castle, which then burnt down very shortly afterwards and all of that was lost. Um, it's just one of those many things in life that you go, oh, I wonder what was there and what happened, uh, what we would have had. Roderick MacLeod, the fourth of Cadwall, also served his time in Parliament. He represented both the county of Cromarty and Sutherland. He trained in law and went on to serve again as Lord Lieutenant of Cromarty and Deputy Lieutenant of Rosshire. He would have with his wife, Isabella, children including Henry Dunning MacLeod, who was a very notable uh, writer on political economy, philosophy, law, banking, uh, a wide range of other subjects. He was described at the time as having a worldwide reputation as one of the ablest and very highest authorities on the subject with which his writings deal. So that you can't get much a higher recommendation than that. Another sibling, Margaret, married the brilliantly named, and if you've been watching me for long enough you'll know I love a good name, and Margaret married Baron de Verte de Rathsomhausen of Ripafrata near Pisa. And there are some really interesting letters in our collection from this time. So this is, um, shows some evidence of some financial issues in the family after Roderick IV died. I think although I haven't delved into this, it looks like it could be regarding the dispersal of money between different family members. And there are numerous letters between these, this brother and sister, Margaret and Henry Dunning, which show the strained relationship that they had at the time with their mother. The mother accuses Henry Dunning MacLeod of trying to do other members of the family out uh, of what they're entitled to. But interesting to note that if he is such a world renowned um, banking and financial expert. Well, I suppose that depends on your feelings about bankers, but you would think that he was uh, aware of what he was doing. And this is, uh, some, here are some extracts from Margaret writing to her brother. And you really get a sense of the personalities involved. My dear Henry, I write to you to warn you under the seal of the greatest secrecy that Mama is very angry at the arrangement we have come to. She has threatened me with revoking her will if I don't break with you. Now I have written to her a moderate letter to pacify her and beg and implore you to do what you can to avoid a rupture in satisfying Mr Baxter as much as possible, who was a financial agent. Both Mr Diverta and myself are most anxious to terminate this affair peacefully. And she goes on and on saying, we just don't want to fight, please try and calm mother down. She says in a later letter, I am driven half wild with M's violence, and she calls her mother M, with M's violence and not knowing who to trust. I warn you of my position, you must try to pacify them all and terminate this most odious business. 
I call it odious on account of all the evil passions it has awakened, and I am most anxious and desirous to terminate it in a in a um, peaceable manner without m any more ill blood. Finally, she says, I never saw such practical hatred. We too, for the present, are rather hard up, but she has kept her promise to the letter. Such hatred of a mother against her own children I cannot conceive. Occasionally I may be hasty for a moment, but that moment past I feel nothing but regret, but a continued hate of a person I am incapable of. I again repeat that you must overlook my previous letter and remember how for months M was writing against you and Bruce to me. I have done much in resisting believing all I was told, but this is a lesson for another time. M allows her imagination to run away with her. Unless one breaks with everybody, she is not content. So quite, um, yeah, you, like I say, you get a bit of a, an, a feeling of the, the strength of opinion in the family. It was at the time of this, um, the fifth of Cadwell, Robert Bruce Aeneas MacLeod, that the destroyed Invergordon Castle was rebuilt, designed by guess who? So if you've been watching for a while, you could probably make a stab at who might have designed and constructed uh, Invergordon Castle when it was rebuilt in 1872-73. It was Alexander Ross. And this is how uh, the son of the family at the time described it. In the early 70s, farmers were prosperous, so the rents came in well and the rates were low. Since the beginning of the century, when the square castle keep was burnt to an empty shell, the family had lived in the east wing, which, with the west wing where the stables were, formed a semicircle with the keep at the base. My father, dissatisfied with these rather mean quarters, then formed the rather ambitious project of pulling everything down and building a mansion worthy of his position. The first step was to pull down the old castle, and this was done by undermining the walls one by one and causing them to fall in one mass. I don't suppose they were quite as big as I imagined, but it was a fine sight to watch from our windows the masses of masonry slowly toppling over and crumbling to pieces on the ground. The main block of the new house was to stand on the space between the two wings, and we used to watch the proceedings of the workmen as the foundations were dug out and filled in and the wa walls were rising before the family turned out of their old quarters and for two years became wanderers on the face of the earth. He goes on to describe the fact that while the castle was being built, they stayed in Edinburgh, they stayed in London, they, they went to uh, different places. Now this MacLeod, the fifth of Cadbull, was a commander in the Royal Navy, but continued that family tradition. And of course, the, uh, I say a family tradition, but it's just the role that so many of our landed families claimed for themselves at that time. Um, being Deputy Lieutenant of the County of Ross, uh, Vice Lieutenant of Cromarty. But I want to really come on now and focus on the next generation, because that's who the bulk of D63 relates to. Robert Bruce Aeneas MacLeod, the fifth of Cadbull, had with his wife Ellen Augusta Willoughby at least seven children. Roderick Willoughby, who would go on and become the sixth of Cadbull, Edith Eliza, who died in infancy, Cicely Julia, Ethel Grace, Torquil, Norman Cranston MacLeod and Olivia Ellen. And it's this generation and their children that this collection really relates to. So I'm aware that that in has been a sort of 12 minute whistle stop tour of about 200 years and a lot of the same names. Um, but I think it's useful always to, to situate people in context. So both in their family context and in the context of the place that they, they are, the buildings, the politics of the time, the kind of position that the family had ac become accustomed to inhabiting. And there are, of course, references to those earlier generations within this collection. So now we come on to look at the bulk of it. Most of this collection relates to Norman Cranston MacLeod, his wife Anna Augusta and their children. Norman was the third son of Roderick MacLeod, the fifth of Cadbull. He was born at Invergordon uh, and went on, he was born in 1866 and went on to study at Temple Grove Prep School in England and then went on to Oxford University. He went on to be admitted to the bar. And again, it's, uh, again, you can see that kind of the role that a family plays. You're either all doctors or you're all 
um, uh, whatever it might be. And in this, this family, there's a, a, a line of law as well. We hold Norman Cranston MacLeod's university certificates and a large amount of his correspondence, as well as a large number of really fascinating reminiscences. And I was so chuffed because when I went in to look at it, this these reminiscences really kind of gratified why I had a sense that this would be a good Lerma Borna because when I went into it there are folders of memories of his life and I was just that's brilliant I'm thinking of doing an upcoming episode purely on the subject of reminiscences in the collections so you can look out for that coming up but here's an extract where Norman Cranston MacLeod talks about his childhood in Invergordon he starts it by he I think it's titled early mornings and he writes about how bad he is at early mornings and how bad he's always been and how the whole family had to move the time they said prayers in the morning because he never came down for them. And he goes on to say that now writing as an older man, he regrets how few mornings he remembers. But this is an extract where he talks about being a young child and he says this is a memory that he thinks he will hold on to after all recollection, other recollections have disappeared. I can remember the nursery fire being lighted in the dark and cold winter mornings at our home in the north of Scotland before we got up. A very pleasant and cheerful proceeding which I do not think I witnessed again for 40 years. There is something extremely pleasurable in lying in the warm bed knowing that it is cold outside but also knowing that one need not get up until the crackling blaze of the wood has set the fire well alight and that one can emerge from the blankets in comparative comfort. In those days we had breakfast in the nursery, no excursions into the morning air were allowed and I have a distinct recollection that we had a particular grievance against the nurse because she consumed the eggs which the cook had intended for us. On the other hand, the eggs may really have been intended for her. Then came schoolroom days and we went downstairs to breakfast in the dining room, a typical pre-Victorian room. Uh, he says that my only remaining visions of this are our melting the butter by the fire in the winter and being taught to dance reels and the Highland Fling under the instruction of Mr Skinner. Of course, it never seems to occur to people who have had that experience that for them to lie in bed and leisurely get up when the room's warm, someone else has had to get up in the cold and light the fire. Um, going forward a little bit, the 1890s were pivotal to Norman Cranston MacLeod. In 1890, he went to what was termed British India to practice as a barrister in Bombay, as it was at the time now, of course, Mumbai. He says, he described the fact that his father had not left him with a huge inheritance. He said, my father kept to his promise. And I really like this. I think this is a really interesting sort of parenting thought. He says, my father left me with enough to provide me with bread, but the butter and jam I had to find for myself. In 1899, he married his wife, Anna, and between them, I think they had four children, Dorothea and Leo, Leopold, uh, who were born, I, th I think, prior to their marriage, so I'm not entirely sure whether they were her children or their children, and I didn't delve right into that. I'm sure the answer will be easy to find, but I didn't go right into that. Uh, and then subsequently after their marriage, Torquil and Margaret. Norman Cranston MacLeod worked his way up through the legal system in India, becoming a judge of the High Court and then Chief Justice in 1919, the same year that he was uh, knighted. And again, as you'll be used to me saying, that cross-reference you can find in the Invergordon Town Council minutes, a reference to his knighthood and his uh, promotion. We hold correspondence from this time as well as the warrants for those royal appointments. So for instance, the Chief Justice appointment was given by the King. We hold passports and official documents, financial records from this time. So things like passbooks and cash books and accounts and expenses. We hold some of his stories and writings, speech notes, shooting diaries, which I can tell you make a bit uncomfortable reading, um, social and function diaries, menus, um, letters from people like Harry Lauder, who says, if you're coming to India, please do come and see me. Notebooks and lists for things like clothing, crockery, um, groceries, events, guests, luggage that he's had stolen from him, and also legal opinions and notes on his cases. So we're able to get some real insights into the family's life, work life and social, 
at this time. Things like lists of groceries and things are absolutely fascinating, really useful. In addition to those original documents, there are also some publications, so maps of areas in India, which includes mar areas marked that can only be uh, accessed by donkey. And a copy of the Bombay Law Reporter, volume 28, which contains an article about Sir Norman uh, Cranston MacLeod with details of his career and the reforms that he was instrumental in. I said that a large amount of this collection uh, relates to him and, and it was interesting to me when I came to look into him to discover that he was the one who in 1923 passed the order to remove Mahatma Gandhi's name from the role of barristers due to his imprisonment for sedition and speaking against the British government. It was signed by the bench but he was the head of the bench at the time and it reinforces and you'll know I hope that usually I'm um, very kind of measured and balanced in, in any opinions but th that kind of reinforces my own personal discomfort with our, the history of the British in India. Um, I'm not kind of qualified to go into that but it makes some uncomfortable reading I think. Norman left the bench in India in 1926 and in that article in the Bombay Law Reporter he is described as uh, like this. A man of striking presence, Sir Norman looked a justiciar in every sense of the term and his calm, dignified and genial expression gave an ennobling touch. He was all kindness. He would extend his helping hand to anyone who asked his favour or assistance. He was always ready to help the junior members of the bar. He meted out in court the same kind of treatment to all practitioners, whatever their class or standing. Interesting that that should be noteworthy. He was accessible to any or every and everyone. There was no artificial suffocating atmosphere, either in his chamber or in his drawing room. The air of stiffness, which was once hanging in the solemn sanctuary of justice, disappeared no sooner he became its recognised high priest. Few judges could have borne the strain of the task Sir Norman opposed upon himself from a high sense of duty. Fewer still could have accomplished it with the same measure of success. We heartily wish and pray that he may enjoy his uh, leisure for many years to come. It's interesting as well, I had a wee look on, I think it was the Bar Society, I can't remember what the exact uh, website was, but it was the, to do with the legal profession in India today. And they have a section about him and they talk about how good it was of him to employ um, Indian staff. And again, it's that thing of going, yes, maybe that was uh, uncommon at the time, but it still is a very, yeah, it's a, like I say, an uncomfortable uh, subject. In response to that speech, Sir Norman said this back, and now I must hand over my charge to my successor. It has already been whispered that I am old fashioned, behind the times, and that may be the case. Although I sometimes think that the various changes which have been inaugurated during the last seven years can hardly be said to be due to ultra-conservatism. On the other hand, I have been accused of want of reverence for the old forms and precedents, the ceremonies and the technicalities which have, said, uh, have been said to make for the prestige and confidence and the semi-religious awe with which the ordinary man should approach the precincts of the court. But I, for one, have considered that these forms and technicalities serve no useful object in these modern times and so far as from inducing awe and reverence, they are more likely to bring the courts into contempt. Which I thought was a really uh, interesting uh, sentence to go, you know, if we set ourselves so far apart from ordinary people that they, can't, uh, that they uh, are in awe of us, why would they deal with us? Norman's wife Anna is also very well represented in this collection and we can see through uh, her correspondence Things like her relationship with her husband and letters relating to her social and charity engagements during their time in what was then, of course, uh, Bombay. Through her diaries, we can find information on household expenses and management. And her financial records include servants' wages, even um, some even have names associated. Diaries and letters and reminiscences of the couple taken together create a really vivid picture of their life together. So dances, dramatic societies, golf, chess and pique travel throughout India, the monsoon season and the impact that has, 
visits from family. He says at one point that he's going out, he hopes to see his uncle, but then his uncle's eaten by a lioness. Um, describes the birth, uh, references to the birth of their children, Torquil and Margaret, who were born in India. He describes the fact that Margaret's birth was very difficult because the doctor couldn't get, uh, the doctor had gone away and they had to find another doctor at short notice and, and the, the, the child was left permanently with a scar on her, a mark on her nose because of the difficult birth. It describes uh, illnesses, including some really striking extracts about an illness which hit India in the 1890s. Have a listen to this and see if you were struck as I was by the contemporary uh, equivalents. So this is 1890s. There were very few people up there. The woods and the jungle were beautifully fresh and green after the rains. They had had 400 inches that monsoon and everything seemed set fair. Only the late rains for the winter crops would not come and the first murmurings were heard about the dreadful scourge, the plague, which even now after 40 years still breaks out in various places in spite of all that science can do to eradicate it. Over the dinner table we discussed the news which was arriving of increased mortality returns from the district of Manvi, which was close to the docks and contained numerous godowns stacked with grain. Only then we were told that during the monsoon there had been an increasing number of deaths from a mysterious disease with which the health officers were not acquainted. Rats were dying in the same fashion and at last it was recognised that plague, which was endemic in Hong Kong, must have been brought to Bombay by rats coming off the ships from the east. The fleas on plague-infested rats left their hosts at death and seeking another home went on to human beings. Fortunately, a foreign scientist called Hafkin was able to segregate and cultivate this plague, bacteria, and so to produce a serum which would give relief, if not immunity. But all that took time, and when I returned to Bombay, the daily returns of death from this plague were mounting up in a truly alarming manner. The authorities were puzzled about what to do. The Indians of all classes had a rooted objection of going into hospital, and so plague cases were concealed as much as possible and the evacuation of infected premises, the only sure remedy, was stoutly resisted. A plague committee was appointed by the government with General G Gatakari, I think, uh, commanding the troops in the city at its head. The soldiers went into the towns surrounded by blocks of houses, uh, towns that had lots of houses, and searched for plague cases. Any found were taken off to the plague isolation hospital. Such proceedings gave great offence and eventually they had to be stopped. But the tale of deaths went up and up and many thousands left for their villages. Trade was at a standstill and the grass was growing in the streets. For some reason, very few Europeans were attacked. But a colonel of the Indian Medical Service, who I know very well, died of this plague. And one of the nurses attending him also died. But these were exceptional and mysterious cases. The municipal officers had red rings painted on the doorposts of houses for every plague case which had occurred in them, with the date, so that it could be seen at once where the worst centres were, and some of the doorposts began to show an appalling tale of red rings. I just thought that was very, very striking, and they go on later to talk about other outbreaks and the additional admin and delays and medical inspections and quarantines that came when they tried to travel out of India that they had to stop at ports and they had to prove that they had uh, been examined by a doctor and so on. And they did travel backwards and forwards to the UK, often leaving their children in the care of distant family members until finally deciding to purchase a house in Guildford so they would have a, the children would have a place to call home. Here's an extract where Norman describes being given the responsibility of looking after Margaret one day, who must have been, uh, yeah, she's four years old, it says. After A went home, I was left alone with the children with Maud to look after them, until the long vacation began when I was to escort them home. They were very good children and they gave me no trouble. I had one remarkable instance of the progress Margaret, just over four years old, was making and how her mind was beginning to work. One afternoon when I happened to be at home and Torquil and Maud were out, I was hard put to amuse her, so I went to the piano and sang her some Scottish songs while she sat on a stool by my side. After I had gone through several songs, I asked her, well, how do you like your poor old father's cracked voice? And without any hesitation, 
she put a consoling little hand on my knee and said, it won't be cracked in heaven. So few words and yet how comprehensive. Moving on uh, a little bit, and I am aware of time, but I shouldn't be too long. Um, World War I, of course, hit this family hard as it did every family. Um, Anna brought the smaller children from England to India in 1915. And perhaps the reason for that was they had lost several nephews by this early stage of the war. Torquil Harry Lionel MacLeod, who was Roderick's son, so Norman's brother, he had died at the age of 15 and the Commonwealth War Graves Commission puts him as serving in the Royal Navy on HMS Goliath. 15 years old, he was killed. Another nephew, Ethel's son, William Torquil MacLeod Belitho, was uh, killed again in 1915 at the age of 22, serving in the 19th Queen Alexandra's own Royal Hussars. That couple had already lost a son at the age of five. And it, that the Belitho family is a whole other interesting story I could go into, but I'm not going to. Um, but you see, even just those two deaths, and there will have been so many others across the family, that maybe that's why in that same year, Anna went to England and brought the children back to India. And the impact was even felt by Norman and Anna as they travelled. So this is an extract from his reminiscences. Tilbury to Bombay, June the 15th, 1918. It would have been an unusual experience in any event, that departure from Tilbury, as I had hitherto always gone out by the overland route. But the feeling of exchanging the comparative safety for, of the home country for the dangers of the sea in the war area was so exceedingly unusual that it defied analysis. For years, the enemy submarines had been cruising round our coasts with the result that the floor of the channel was strewn with the wrecks of sunken vessels very often because their skippers had trusted to luck and had failed to observe the precautions advised by the authorities. The merchant skippers had opposed the convoy system, which at last had begun to work in an orderly manner owing to the increase of the number of vessels available for escort duty. And so our tender proceeded down the river to where the Gregory Apcar was at anchor. One of the most noticeable features of the journey was the almost complete absence of any other craft on the waters which in peacetime were so crowded with vessels passing up or down the river. Then we found that our ship had some queer design painted on her sides. This was what was called camouflage. The object of which was to deceive the enemy looking through his periscope with regard to the speed at which the ship was going and the particular direction in which she was going. Every ship had a different design, but all were calculated to deceive in the same way. And on the voyage, we were able to judge from other ships how difficult it was to calculate these matters properly. And through this device, although this device was not an absolute protection, camouflage ships had a better record of successful voyages than those which were not. And even closer to home, Leo, that oldest son, went off to fight, writing back to Norman frequently letters that we hold in this collection. Initially, he set off quite positively, saying to his father, um, we are enjoying ourselves quite well, in spite of plenty of hard work. He then says, I don't expect to see any fighting because the war will probably be over by before December, which of course was quite a commonly held view at the time. Leo survived the war, but was held as a prisoner of war. And we do have some of his memories of his wartime uh, experience. And I wanted to just share a little extract with you because there's something quite poetic about his writing. He says, I was so busy with my section that I had not time to listen to bullets passing. In fact, the first that came so close that it forced itself onto my attention, I mistook for a bird as it chipped its way through a twig with a curious cheep cheep. Talking of bullets, it's curious what noises they make. Ricochets hum like an angry wasp. If one gets one past the, if one goes past the ear close up, it just whispers its message to you. But if it almost grazes, then you're deaf for about a day. Not because the bullet yells with vexation at missing, but because a vacuum is formed and the air rushes backwards and forwards and strikes the eardrum. At least, I believe that is the explanation. Quite. There's something there about the bullet whispering its message to you and uh, screaming in vexation that it, when it misses. 
After the war, as happened with so many stately homes and estates in this country, the MacLeods of Cadwall sold their Invergordon estate and in eight, around about uh, 1928, Invergordon Castle was knocked down by the new owner, Sir William Martineau of Kincraig, who owned another castle nearby. Apparently it was due to increasing financial problems, which was incredibly common. And if anyone is in the market for a, a new podcast to listen to, one of my favourites is She Done It, which is about crime fiction. And there's an episode, the most recent one, is about that exact phenomena of the number of stately homes that were lost in Britain uh, between the wars. Norman Cranston MacLeod died in 1945 and the collection then follows the next generation too. So for instance there are folders of correspondence and photos and legal documents and army documents relating to Torquil and his wife Ellen, uh, Eileen. Torquil served in the military in the Second World War and also items relating to Leo, including those memories of World War I and documents from later in his life as well. There are also references to other members of the family in the collection. And I think it's really good wherever you can to take a long view of a family, and it's not always possible, but the more you can learn about the context of a family and a life, the better. So for instance, we have just in half an hour seen this family come through the Union of the Parliaments of Scotland and England, the Jacobite Risings, the purchase of estates, the sale of estates, the construction and deconstruction uh, or destruction of castles, the impact of the First World War and the Second World War, and the complete transformation of the social, political and empirical landscape that, that covered those generations. Quite extraordinary the difference in a couple of hundred years. I could have drawn many more stories from this collection and I will do so in the future, like I say I'm going to do a reminiscences episode, but hopefully that gives you some information uh, about this collection. I'm sorry Celia to see that you couldn't hear it very loud today, maybe it will be louder if you go back on YouTube, uh, and, and aside to anyone who doesn't know that, all the previous episodes are on our YouTube channel. I hope you can join me next week uh, where I'll be looking at the diaries of Sylvia Blaine, and Sylvia is the sister of Malcolm Blaine, who so many of you are familiar with through previous episodes. But thank you for joining me today and I'll look forward to speaking to you next week. A reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in the Learn with Lorna series of talks. But again, if you're able to donate to us, uh, we're very grateful for that. It enables us to keep doing uh, the work that we uh, undertake. So thank you so much for that.